our gracious, wonderful, loving Heavenly Father. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you that you know what's going on around us. You know how tomorrow is going to affect us, what it's going to do with our stand for the Lord. When a teacher has the gall to tell a young lady to get rid of that mask because it says Jesus loves me, how dare her. Father, we need to take a stand as well. We need to call these senators and we need to tell them how rotten that act is. Sometimes they can't see the forest through the trees. Sometimes they don't even read what they vote on. And Father, I just pray that this does not pass. Because Christians throughout the country took a stand, made them realize that we as Christians aren't going to put up with this stuff. And I thank you for these folks who are here this evening. I'm sure that there are some who really don't feel real good, and they could certainly have stayed home, but they came to hear your word. So I bless, pray you're blessed tonight in a, in a wonderful way. Open our eyes, open our minds, open our ears so that we see and hear things and understand things we could not otherwise understand. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have... Um, Bill, stand if you would, and um, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 6 and um, verses 1 through 17. Now, that's, I don't like doing that a lot, but uh, that's the way it seems to be uh, to uh, read all of that. So, kind of try to stay focused in it, okay? All right, Bill. That's the way things are going to be. But guess what? You and I ain't going to be there, folks. And we're going to be talking about the uh, last days in the weeks to come and the rapture of the church and some things about heaven. I think uh, you'll be amazed at what God does. So in this chapter, God will allow the nation of Israel to go through extremely tough times. You know, we look at what Hitler did, and guess what? It's going to be like that and worse for the Israelites. Hitler hated the Jew. God loves the Jewish people, but they rejected him. And we're going to find in chapter 7 that there will be 144,000 people, say, people um, saved during that time. And I know that there'll be many others too, but they have um, in chapter 7 from 5 through 8 uh, tell us how those 144,000 people will come, and it's 12,000 people from every tribe. But there will be others saved. Now, the problem is there is no Holy Spirit to convict their hearts. The only reason we trusted Christ as our Savior, the only reason that we began to think in His ways was because He was the one who dealt with your heart and your mind to bring conviction to your hearts. Now, over the years, I've had people come forward trusting Christ as their Savior. Some come forward with smiles on their faith, 
and others come forward, the tears are actually flowing down their cheeks, and there are others who, who come and they look uh, kind of like stoic. But guess what? The final product is salvation. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary's cross for you and for me. So here we see that God is going to allow this uh, nation of Israel to go through really tough times again. The history of Israel has been unbelievable. As you see some of the events that have happened to that nation. Extreme persecution, folks, extreme persecution. And the final trial will serve as a purification process and the results are that people will be saved by the thousands. We have to remember there's only seven years in this now and that's going to be it. Israel will survive the heat of the refining process that we talked about last week and accept Jesus Christ when he comes back again. You have to remember that. He's going to come back and then they're going to see the one that they crucified on Calvary's cross and turn from their, their sinful ways and acknowledge Christ as their own Savior. Um, if, if the Lord Jesus were not to come back when he does, the Bible tells me that the nation of Israel would literally be annihilated. That's how bad these times are going to be. So when in Romans chapter 11, verses 26 and 27 on the screen, so all, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob and is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That's what's going to happen. So when the time comes for God to get Israel prepared for restoration, that's what he's doing. He's going to restore that which had been lost. Restoration and re replace it with his blessings in so many different ways. The purpose of the church, like this one, there ain't gonna be any. There won't be one like this anymore. It'll be gone. And uh, we will then be raptured. That's where the rapture will take place. And the funny thing is, it's going to happen just as quickly when the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 came into uh, those who were in that, that room and uh, th that folks was a tremendous way of saying okay the church is here now but the church is going to be raptured all of you will be raptured all of us will be raptured because we know Christ is our Savior and those who are not saved are going to go through horrible, horrible, horrible times. We can't even imagine what they will go through. And as we also read, Bill read just a little while ago, that um, people will try to hide in caves and things like that. And it won't make any difference. We can't hide from the Lord. We can't pretend that he doesn't see us because he always sees us. Um, the seven years of the tribulation will begin, Acts chapter 2. And it's a time of horrible events. The tribulation is not brought on by man. You would think after the way we mess things up all of our lives and it carries over then to the next generation that we must have something to do with the uh, the rapture of the church and the, um, the the events that are taking place then over those last seven years. So it's not something that is brought on by man. It isn't something that's brought on by Satan. It's brought on by God. The Bible warns mankind. 
How shall we escape if we ne neglect such a great salvation? How can we escape that? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Now, last Wednesday, we learned that John was looking at a scroll or a book, whichever you want to call it. And he's witnessing the very events of the end times. That's what he's seeing taking place. His heart must have been, what shall I say, must have been uh, hardened because of the events that were happening. Not hardened against the things of God, but he just couldn't imagine what was going on in the world. And uh, folks, that's, that's going to be a, quite a time. But praise God again, you know, we aren't going to be there. We're not going to be there. So Revelation 6, 1 through 17 gives us the picture. And as the four seals of the scroll are broken, we find that judgment seemed to be a description of the Antichrist gaining control of the nations of the world. And during this time, a great number of Jews are going to be saved, 144,000 according to chapter 7. He will do it by waging war. That is the red horse. Why would that horse, which was red, why would that be the thing to represent that time? blood, isn't it? Blood. It's red. And we're going to dwell on that some more here in, in, in the chapters to come as to how that takes place and what happens. And so here we see that the red horse is representative of, of war and the bloodshed of this particular battle and uh, by controlling the world economy. That's the black horse. And by having those who opposed him put to death. That's the pale horse. Now, the white horse is the first one mentioned. And if you remember last week, we talked about that and there are a couple of things that it says there about the white horse and the rider on the horse that really do not represent the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, the bow. Jesus didn't have a bow when, when he came or when he comes. Uh, the, the other thing is, um, boy, my mind slipped. Oh, the crown. The crown was not representative of victory. It was more like, um, how many of you wrote that name down? I can't think of it. Well, whatever it is. Um, that white horse is more than likely the Antichrist. Although there are some theologians that uh, believe the rider of the white horse is Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, the great deceiver. That's what he was, the white horse. Um, there are now two more seals to be broken in the sixth chapter. Jesus turns to a lion. He turns to a lion, acting like a lion would act. He's no longer this... Uh, sheepish <laughs> lamb. We have moved from the beauty of heaven to the reality of the wrath of God. And we're going to see God's wrath all the way from chapter 6, which we are tonight, all the way over to chapter 19. So let's talk about that fifth seal for a little bit. You have something, uh, Pam? No. Oh, I'm sorry. 
the fifth seal, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, 9 through 11. God's judgment continues to be revealed to John. And John, of course, has written this and he's telling it us as well. This fifth seal, John was underneath, the Bible tells us, he was underneath this, this scroll, this book, and it depicts the picture of all of these people who were Christians were killed because of their stand for Christ. And that's what that story was about with that little girl. So here John, underneath the book, the seals are open, and he can see all the names of those who had died for the cause of Christ. They were killed. These are martyrs killed during the four judgments or seals of the book. So all that happened during this time, not today, but then. They were preaching the gospel. Now, I kind of wonder what they meant by that preaching, because that's what I do, that's what uh, James does. Uh, they were presenting the gospel of salvation to people that they saw. They knew that they would be raptured, and they wanted others to go with them, family members, loved ones, neighbors, relatives, friends. They wanted those people to come to Christ. And they were martyred as a result of their stand for the Lord to continue to do that. They were preaching the gospel. The world in the end times is going to reject God's word. It's going to reject it. The world. Governments of the world will demand that Christians give their first allegiance to the state and that they remain quiet about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's going to be forced upon those who are going through these, these judgments. You and I are gone, but these judgments are still taking place. And people, by the way, are still being saved. They just won't have the, uh, the privilege like you and I have had of the unction the scripture speaks of in bringing you and me to the Lord Jesus Christ because we have a need to be saved from our own sin. So here we are. They'll put laws in place against worshiping God. Mm -hmm. That's part of what this um, equality thing is about. Jesus taught that identical sequence of events during his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. You could read Matthew 24 and you can relate it right here to the events that are spoken of here. The sixth seal, Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17. God's wrath begins. Okay, here we go. The universe is going to be shaken, folks, not just the earth, but the entire universe is going to be shaken. There will be a great earthquake. A great earthquake. One that is stronger than any that is recorded in history. Property will be destroyed. Millions of people will be killed. It's going to be a horrible thing to take place. Then there will be aftershocks. And there will be more earthquakes. There will be more destruction and more death because of this earthquake. The effects of God's wrath upon, the, upon the, the universe. Take a look at verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great 
earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned to blood red. And the stars of the sky fell to earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by the strong wind. Those stars, the things that are out there in the universe are going to come down here and blow up our, our world. That's just part of it. Now in verses 15 and 16, here are the effects of God's wrath upon the people. Then the kings of the earth, the principals, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave, every free man hid in caves amongst the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They realize who's doing this. The Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Nobody. Nobody. So there's some real tough things, folks, that are going to take place. The reason for those catastrophes and the panic of men is because of what they see going on around them and they have no control of any of it. Matthew 24, 7 is on the screen. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Huh. Other things are going to be taking place as well. Think of the, the United States. Think of a, a massive earthquake taking place. And think of how that changes the, the earth just because of our country. It won't be smooth anymore. There'll be, there'll be um, great caverns of destruction and things torn up and swallowed and everything else that you can think of. And the reason for these catastrophes is because they reject Christ as their Savior. Even when all this takes place, they still deny the Lord. The sun and moon will eclipse and be blackened. The stars or meteorites will hit the earth and thousands of people will be killed. There will be volcanic eruptions. Um, this past week there was a, a mountain that erupted in the first time in 800 years. Iceland. Yeah. Iceland. There will be hurricanes. We know what those are. There will be tornadoes. We know what those are. The sun will be darkened. And a third part of the sun and moon will be darkened. A third of it. It won't be an eclipse like we normally have. So this is really something to take place. But look here, it says in, in verse 12 again, the whole moon turned blood red. Oh boy. It's coming, folks. Revelation and turn to chapter 8, verse 12, if you would, please. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet. Now we are in a different set of judgments. The first judgments are these seals that are opened up. The next thing, uh, matter of fact, the, uh, the last seal that we're talking about is going to reveal the first seal, which is uh, the trumpets as they sound. And there uh, are seven of those. But take a look here. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck, struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard the eagle was flying midair, call out in a loud voice, and hear the woes of Scripture. 
woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the trumpet blast's about to be sounded by other three angels. And we're going to be taking a look at that starting next week. It'll be a different set of judgments to be brought upon the earth. Now take a look at chapter 9, verse 2. And when he opened the, opened the abyss, that is the, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, the, the place we know as hell, but it's much worse than that. The abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to describe what that just said. But when that abyss is open, folks, unlike anything you can, I, I could ever imagine. So here we have it once again. Now, I want you to go all the way back to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 13. It's interesting how the God, God put the scriptures together in such a way that we can see what's going to happen in the events of Revelation all the way back in the Old Testament over 2,000 years before it ever happened. Verses 9 through 11. See the day that the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and the constellation will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. Boy. And you could read even more and see what's going to be taking place. This is not a fun time, folks. This is going to be horrible. Those who remain, I, I, I just can't believe what they might be thinking with all this going on around them and uh, the gospel has been presented throughout the world and they still refuse to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That is where this ends and then the opening of the trumpets. You're not going to want to miss those either. All right. Let's, let's pray, okay? Our Heavenly Father, it's, it's a good thing that we can trust and rest in you as our Savior. We thank you for the provision of salvation with the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he's alive and well, even tonight, and sits at the right hand of the Father. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you that we can celebrate that. And I pray now that you would bless these folks. I thank you for the questions. I thank you for their attention. These things are somewhat difficult to understand because they are beyond our ability to comprehend. And one day this will all come to pass, and we thank you. Be with these folks, keep them safe as they travel, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.